Thank you. We are. Yes, sir. We're All right. Um, <clears throat> welcome to the uh, October Great Valley Work Session. First thing up is uh, comments by a student rep. Hello. Oh, reps. Oh, you can see it behind yeah, the podium. Exactly. Yeah. Hello, hello. Yeah. Everyone. Oh, no. I think so, yeah. Thank you all for having us here tonight. Um, I will be sharing a quick recap of our international classroom program, which is our exchange with um, Danish students. So on Thursday, um, we marked the successful completion of our 10 day Danish exchange program, where 24 students from Great Valley engaged in a cultural exchange with 27 counterparts from Elsinore Gymnasium. We would like to extend our heartfelt gratitude to the parents, faculty, and students whose contributions provided students with meaningful cultural experiences <clears throat> and helped contribute to the program's success. As we approach our 30th year, the program has provided numerous students with ex really exciting experiences, including visits to Washington, D.C., New York City, um, and in these locations, they've been able to explore iconic American sites like the Senate Gallery and the Times Square. During these trips, students have explored the commonalities and differences in their neighborhoods and communities and ultimately created a project where groups designed their ideal neighborhoods. In March, Great Valley students will experience Danish hospitality during their 10-day stay in Elsinore. The exchange has followed fostered an appreciation for our local community, established enduring friendships, and enriched global perspectives. As we celebrate the achievements of this recent exchange, we eagerly anticipate the forthcoming Danish leg, marking an exciting event in our student senior year. Thank you to all the faculty and staff of all involved. Uh, hello, everybody. I would like to talk a little bit about homecoming this weekend. So the homecoming football game is against Unionville, and it's this Friday at 7 p.m. And the homecoming dance is on Saturday, uh, October 14th from 7 to 10 p.m. at the high school. Uh, this week, students have been showing their school spirit with school spirit days. Today was pajama day. And on Friday, we will have a pep rally after school or uh, at the end of the school day where students will play games in the football field. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> the monthly uh, enrollment reports there for review. Um, committee policy meeting. Any update? Yes, we had our first meeting of the school year a couple of weeks ago on September 26th. I'll try and quickly go through these policies since we'll have them up for first reading. Uh, we went through the communications policy 901 that was just minor revisions suggested by council um, we discussed the policy to understand if it, this is a policy in general about communications it's not our social media policy which is a special a separate policy just so you know when you're reviewing that this is just a general communications policy how we communicate with the community etc um, we had one about public attendance at school events again it was just minor revisions no nothing substantial we had no changes um, we discussed a policy that we have all called a 905 community advisory committee. Uh, we questioned the board members whether this is the same thing as when we have uh, things like our, our um, Council on Diversity and Inclusion or when we've um, had councils in the past to look at, you know, redistricting or things like that. This is something different. This is really like a specifically when the board tasks the community to go do something without us and then come back, which we haven't used in my terms on the board. Um, and other 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 school districts have have just done away with this. It doesn't exist everywhere anymore. We were okay with leaving it in case we ever needed it, but we had wording added in there to explain the difference. Because if you read it, you might think it's the same thing as a CDI or a, or a whatever kind of other advisory group we might we might um, you know need for you know whatever the district lines or things like that. So we added um, in the following language: citizen advisory committees are generally comprised entirely of community members designated by the board to provide recommendations on a particular topic when requested by the board. And a district administrator may be identified as a liaison between the board and the citizen advisory committee and to facilitate the work of the citizen advisory committee. Citizen advisory committees are different than committees of the board or other administrative committees or working groups of district officials where community members may be asked for input or provide an opportunity to serve as a parent or community representative of the committee. So this is something we're not using right now. We decided as a, as a group, we'll just keep it, but just make very specific what it is in case we do need to do it. The next policy we talked about was the complaint policy. There's a whole um, 
escalation of level one through four. We just wanted to understand more what that, how that worked and what happens after level four. There is nothing after level four because of course the highest level. Um, and this is a process used when formal cl complaints occur in the district. Uh, 907 was our all school visitors. There were just minor revisions. We had no changes uh, suggested. <clears throat> Policy 908 is relations with parents or guardians. Um, this is, uh, the, the solicitor said that this is not a required policy since the majority of this policy is addressed in little pieces in other areas, but we decided to keep it. We thought it was useful, but again, no changes um, that we made and he'd only made non-substantial revisions. To go to the second page, policy 912.1 is research involving students and staff, um, like surveys and things. This is our policy that says when, you know, when and how you can do surveys, if you can do surveys. Um, and this is a policy that had been discussed at length when it was uh, re reviewed last time, uh, three years ago, I think. And we had no, no additional changes beyond the non-substantive changes that the um, solicitor suggested. The next one is relationships, relations with the IU. Um, no revisions were proposed. We're leaving this exactly as is. Policy 916 was on, is on school volunteers. Mm -hmm. Um, there were there was a couple of tiers, tier one and tier two designations. These were eliminated at the advice of our council. Um, the AG was moved to a separate document. Um, and the policy distinctions are still there as far as different kinds of volunteering, but there's no longer a tier. So people want a tier one or a tier two volunteer. Um, someone asked if the list of volunteers and their information is applicable to right to know requests. So let's going to clarify this information is not applicable to right to know. So we're not having to turn over those people's personal information. Uh, and this, if we pass this, this will, I was actually looking at the school board website for something earlier and noticed that it talks about volunteers at these different tiers. So we'll obviously need to update the website uh, if we pass this just to eliminate that, that complication. Policy 918 is parent and, and family engagement. This is a title one related policy, just minor revisions. Um, and the committee decided that once we have the equity review completed and presented to the board, and there's a comprehensive plan, this policy amongst others will be brought for review. Because as we looked at it, we talked about some of the early findings of the, pol of the equity review and wondered, you know, should some of that be embedded in this policy and others? And we decided just to wait until the, the administration brings forward the final recommendations for the equity review, and then we'll identify which policies uh, may need to be updated and we'll go through them and, and bring them forward to the board. Next one, almost done here, was can policy 919, campaigning and other political activity or district property, um, on district property, sorry, just minor non-substantial provisions made by council um, and we had no further changes. Again, I know this was discussed a few years ago, uh, last time it came up for review. So I, I think we covered most of the changes then. And then finally, we talked about our policy 920 on civility. Um, there were minor revisions, the AG um, administrative guidelines, sorry, I should have said that, it was moved to a separate document. Um, and this is a general civility policy. This does not apply to public comment at board meetings. Um, that's its own policy. And um, this policy applies to any other interaction, whether it be at sporting events between two district employees or, or between community members and district employees. So it's not board meetings, but any other kind of interaction. Um, and, and again, no, we didn't make changes beyond what was advised. So that's what we covered. We have another meeting um, late October, okay. October 24th. And then after that, there's three more um, scheduled this year, which should take us through all of our policies that are up for you. I know I went through that quickly. Any questions? Well done. <clears throat> all right, so next week we'll be voting on the first reading. All right, uh, moving on to the superintendent's update. Thank you, Mr. Barron. Good evening. Uh, no PowerPoints from me. I'll pause and let you just enjoy that announcement. Um, however, I will have um, Ms. Blake and Dr. Beck will be up in a, in a moment. They are going to share on, on my behalf, <laughs> but it's not my PowerPoint. Uh, I, I do, I do want to highlight, though, in board docs is the revised copy of the district goals. I know they've been shared previously. I took the board's feedback. Uh, if you are agreeable with those, uh, we're happy to move forward and share those more widely. If you have additional feedback, certainly uh, I welcome it, but I, I thought I did a 
respectable job capturing your feedback and adding the enhancers that you wanted to see. Uh, so those are there in board docs for, for your review. Um, just a couple of very quick announcements before I turn it over to Dr. Beck. Um, one is as a reminder that on November 6th, which will be our next work session, um, Dr. Wetzler will be here to provi provide a draft equity plan, a multi-year equity plan for your review. Um, Sorry, what date? Did that'll you be on November 6th. Also, this month, we were planning to do a presentation regarding world language recommendations moving forward. Uh, I recognize we, we may not have a full board or close to a full board next week. In addition, a little extra time will help us to better massage and fine tune um, some items that we'd like to provide to you. So the world language recommendation presentation, uh, unless someone feels stronger, I'd like to defer that to November 13th. And at that point, we will um, present that. And I know Dr. Beck, Dr. Beck will be leading that presentation as well. And just as a reminder, I know we brought this up last time we were together, but in November, I will start bringing at least two draft calendars to you. Uh, we really don't need to improve it until January or February. Let's see how our construction project goes. But as that reminder, with a school trying to meet the deadline, do we maybe want to consider starting after Labor Day to give us a little bit of a cushion? Um, that'll be there. So uh, November, a lot going on with the equity plan, the world language recommendations, and we'll begin that calendar process in November. Quick update, uh, just regarding our 5-8 planning, which is ongoing all the time. Um, Start times for the 5-6 center, we were thinking we were going to have some bus routes calculated. As you know, transportation has been very challenging this year. Uh, we are going to ask for an additional month. So next month, I also hope to come back with some official start times for both the 5-6 center, uh, for both the students there and the staff. And we're only talking about the 5-6 center at, at this particular juncture. Uh, so that is uh, right on the horizon. I know there's been a lot of questions about music. And by December, we hope to be able to more clearly articulate K-12 music implications. So we're working with staff. I've been in communication with our parent booster, GVMPA. And so we're kind of moving down these parallel paths of what does a music program look like uh, with our new configuration. So uh, work, and I really think December is a realistic target for us to bring to the board what the music program will look like. It's not gonna be drastically different. It really won't be, but um, I know there are questions out there amongst board members in the community, so we just really want to uh, make sure we're very definitive in terms of the information. And then lastly, you've heard us talk countless times about electives at the middle school. Uh, we are excited about that student choice and the creation of new electives. Uh, our goal is to have those determined no later than January, uh, because we would need students to then select in March so that we could start building a schedule. So just to give you some of those hallmark elements of our five to eight planning, I thought it was important. Let me stop there before Dr. Beck, and you can maybe work your way to the podium, but are there any questions with the goals or any of the announcements or information I just provided? All right. Well, I thank you. Um, Dr. Beck, as you can see, um, asked, I really asked her for two things. One is, Let's bring some real um, substance to what core extension looks like and what it will look like moving forward into the five, six, and the seven, eight. I know the board and myself have gotten a few questions about what the new schedules will look like. The core extension period really is going to be a key part. So we wanted to break that out this evening and let Dr. Beck kind of highlight what all will go in there and how we really think this transition is going to be beneficial. At the same time, she will highlight for you our literacy and math specialists. You've heard us talk about these positions, but you'll really see their importance and how their, um, their use and their impact really manifest in core extension. And as we extend this core extension model from the elementary into the five, six, seven, eight, we do want to start having the, the dialogue with the board about specialists in the five, six and the seven, eight. We have the ability to transfer and move some people in, but there might also be some needs or possibilities where maybe some new staff could be discussed. And I know we have staffing concerns and constraints, but at least we want to start to socialize this with you and then we'll have the discussion in an ongoing way. Dr. Peck, I think I set the stage and sure. I'm going to turn it over to you. So thank you for, sure. for being here. So, um, so 
as Dr. Grafredo shared, um, he asked me to come this evening to talk about core extension, which is a period of time that we've had or a block of time that we've had in the elementary schedule for over 10 plus years. Um, currently, that block of time exists in third, fourth, and fifth grade um, currently. So Dr. Grafredo, I'm going to ask you to advance to that next slide. Um, and so core extension is a block of time that's consistent within the school day. So currently it's consistent for every grade level. So for instance, at Katie Markley, third grade has a set core extension block where all third graders have core extension at the same time. And then at a different time during the day, fourth grade has that core extension block. And then at a different time, fifth grade has that. And that's true across the elementary buildings. That's a consistent time. And within that block of time, that's where students receive small group and indiv individualized instruction. That could be from their regular education teacher. It could be from another individual or specialist within the building. It's also where students receive services and support. Um, as I shared, during that time, grade level teachers, or as we look forward to the five, six, and the seven, eight, grade, grade level teachers or the ELA and math teacher would deliver small group individualized instruction. It's also a time where no new instruction is taught. So it's a time that block of time is something that's used and set up in schools. It's called something different in schools across the country, but it's intended for students to not be pulled from core instruction to receive the services they need, the support they need, um, and provides an opportunity that's consistent. It also allows us to maximize the number of specialists who are available to support students. So rather than having that block of time exist at the same time for all, for all third, fourth, and fifth grade students by breaking it out by grade level, or as we look forward, and I'll talk about you know, shortly, it allows us to then ensure that we have the specialists needed to provide those services to students at different times across the school day. And so currently, as I shared right now in third, fourth and fifth grade, so this is looking forward, but right now in third, fourth and fifth grade, there's a 45 minute block of time in the schedule at every one of our elementary schools for this core extension to take place. When you saw in previous presentations that Dr. Tool and myself or Dr. Souders and Dr. O'Toole did, when we look forward to the five, six center in that schedule, we were able to schedule a 30 minute period of time that has an English language arts focus so that that would be additional support, enrichment, remediation focused on English language arts, and then a separate 30 minute block for math. So it also allows us to extend that core instruction slightly too, to ensure that students actually receive more than just that core. So it's small group, it's individual, but it's focused um, in ELA or, and or math. And then at the middle school in grades seven and eight, we were able to build in a 49 minute period core extension. At the five, six center, are you saying per day? Per day, mm -hmm. per day. Mm -hmm. Right now, um, we're competing in that 45 minute period of time in third, fourth and fifth grade. We've been able to make it work, but if a student needs math support and reading support, it gets tricky to manage that. We we have a model that works, but it also, that will allow us some of that additional time. Um, during core extension, it's a very busy time of the day. Um, and typically a student's core extension schedule is blocked out over the six day cycle. So there are a number of things that happen on any given day during core extension. And this would be true, like I said, as we look forward five, six, seven, eight, but on any given day, you may see a third, fourth, or fifth grade teacher using that time. Students may be continuing to independently read, independently write, working on additional practice. That teacher's pulling small groups of students based on strengths or needs who are there in the classroom at that point in time to reinforce a concept, like I said, to enrich something. They may be individually conferring with students. At that same time, our literacy specialists that we have now within each of our elementary schools, as well as our intervention teachers is what they're called currently in our elementary buildings and looking forward math specialists may be providing support to regular education students um, through they push in during that time period. So they're in the classroom with the students or they have the opportunity to pull students out if needed. And those students aren't missing new instruction during that time also, students may receive specialized services 
So special education teachers may be delivering, for instance, a Wilson reading program during that time. Students may be re receiving their ESL support. OT and PT services are scheduled as well as speech and language. It's also a time that gifted support services are happening. So some of those services are happening during that core block of time, but they also happen during core extension. And again, in addition, currently our students in fourth and fifth grade are participating in their instrumental music lessons, one time per cycle during that time as well. So it is a time where students traditionally would have been pulled across the day and this allows a consistent block of time where students aren't necessarily missing new instruction, but they're able to get the services, enrichment, support, additional practice that they need. And just to add, as Trisha indicated, it's scattered throughout the day. So core extension really moves at all hours of the day. One of the things we talked about with our reimagined middle school schedule was that eighth period. You can kind of like a quasi core extension, but it's for all 1100 students at the end of the day in that slot. And so we're really forcing a lot in. Even here in the elementary, you get a sense of how much is going on when it's dispersed. You can imagine how intense it is when it's all in one window for double the amount of children. So again, just giving rationale, we'll, we'll talk about those other elements, but I wanted to make that nexus to core extension with the replacement of eighth period in our middle school. Right. Um, Trisha, before we go into the specialist, Let's just see if the board members have any direct questions regarding core extension. Is there any additional context or information we can provide? Just for the, uh, are we talking only right now about the elementary or, or can, did you just, what you described also include the, the seven, eight? So what we described would also be the same model that would be used consistently across five, six and seven, eight. And so for like right now in the middle school, the, the eighth period, some students, if they don't have a need for any kind of additional support. Um, they use that as a as a study hall um, and they're able to get it ahead on their homework. Um, will will there be situations where that kind of free free time for like a homework jumpstart be available with this new model? So the core extension block, as Dr. Grafredo shared, will be staggered across the day for eighth grade students. So students, there may be a house or a team of students that has it first period, a team of students that has it second. So it can be used, we would envision when it's, when it's focused on ELA or math, that it would be used for additional practice or reinforcement, which is what homework is, additional practice. So, but it may not happen at the end of the day. So we will need, as we plan for that time though, to have conversations with ELA and math and other subject area teachers to think through what does that additional practice look like? So traditionally it's looked like homework that they assign that then they all do at the same time at the end of the day. But we'll, but with that additional practice happening across the day, we'll need to have those conversations. Okay, but it is still theoretically possible that that these the students can use it to minimize kind of the burden of homework, ho however that that is packaged after school, you know, at home. We need to have homework conversations. That's been a topic in the district as we talk about responsibilities outside the school day. What does meaningful practice look like? And so we anticipate having homework and meaningful practice conversations woven into our planning for core extension time. If that makes sense. I think the reality of your question is if you've got kids having that core extension first period, they're not going to have homework right. to do at that point, right? So, but they're not unless they're going to use it for it, they're going to the kids who know they have it first period are going to do their homework from the night. No, no, right. because because uh, I think it's going to be happening is they're going to be doing other stuff is the goal, not necessarily. <laughs> the goal time is that every single kid in seventh and eighth will have specialized work in core extension assigned outside of home. Correct. It would be in addition to, I think the conversation is around what does practice and what's meaningful ELA and math content that can be addressed during that time that reinforces, supports, or enriches the learning. So I think we need to have conversations woven into that planning around homework. Right, but, the, but at the end of the day, today, a period, there's a chunk of students, whatever percentage that is, they use eighth period as a homework study hall, right? And get their homework done. And that isn't going to exist 
in the future with the way this is going to be designed. The goal is to have core extension being enhancements or whatever is needed. In addition, there will be homework the kids will probably have to take home and do at home. Correct. There will be homework. I think, again, we have to talk about how much. Sure. Right. What are our sure. district homework guidelines? What what is what does that balance look like for students? We've been having those conversations with Ms. Dinsmore and with our school counselors and all those pieces. So I think, again, it comes back to planning. There will be more minutes within our core content area subjects that we haven't had in the past. I know there's not many, but six minutes, you know, five or six minutes every day adds up. So sometimes too, that additional practice is assigned because the period is not as long as ideally we would like it to be. And then also how are we designing, like I said, meaningful practice. So it's not just additional problems to do the problems to do them and to have homework, but really making sure that what we're planning for in terms of practice makes sense. So really having intentional conversations about what work are students taking home to do and then also what work are we doing within the classroom where the teachers there to support us too, because we have begun to have conversations around homework and homework is considered by some to not be an equitable practice. And so again, coming back to because different students have different supports at home. Um, so really having hard conversations about what does that practice look like? Um, and then also, how are we using that additional time within our core content area blocks too? And I think that's a really, I just want to emphasize that, Trisha. The idea of homework is for extended practice. What we're now presenting are models that allow for more minutes, hours each week for extended practice in our five, six, and our seven, eight. So the idea is, yes, we can continue. We now have more extended practice time built in. We've increased Matt, I'll use math for the example. We now have six minutes more of math instruction just on the seventh, eighth period. Then they go back for an additional core extension period for additional practice. So I would suspect if kids are practicing more in school, they'll probably practice a little less when it comes in terms of homework. Now, don't misinterpret. We're not saying homework's going away, right? But I think we have to look at that ebb and flow. If they're practicing more at school, do you really need that same extent or do we need the same magnitude? So I appreciate where our team is going to go, where they're going to engage our teachers and talk more with this extra time. What, are, what do we need to do? And I'm sure it's going to be an ongoing conversation for a while as we start to adopt a new model and we really start to see how our children and staff see it all play out in practice. So I just, Trisha, I think that's a great emphasis point. And uh, Ms. Chesnut, just to go to your question, the core extension we are not designing that with the idea of a study hall or downtime for students. I think, Mr. Barrett, you, you kind of explained that. But just to, to be clear, but I do realize some students do capture it currently. It really is the focus is to provide that enrichment, remediation, that opportunity. And so we know that's a shift. So we still have to work with our staff and our students about how do we make that a palatable shift so that we can build it in. But I want to be clear, it's also not a study hall for individuals. We're, we're really looking to maximize our students' time with their, their teachers. And that was one of the things I brought to you last year was we've increased the contact and it's substantially between our students and our staff. And we want to be true to that. But I think you have some other. Yeah, well, I just want to, I think that, that I think that it could get into just from a communications perspective, kind of dangerous territory where we where people might hear that there could be either reduced time to to kind of complete the homework in school, or even the hearing what you're saying, additional homework that kind of comes from this core extension model. I just want to make sure that that is really understood kind of by the community, that that's not what the intention is, um, that that there should be no, you know, that, that, the, that the time the students are spending practicing will be divided among the core extension and homework, um, and that, that it is kind of a, a zero sum. The intent is in no way, shape, or form to assign homework as a result of core extension, <laughs> so that that would be an opportunity for them to do some of that practice okay. to really be cognizant of balance. Thank you for those questions. Um, 
The next part is just to highlight the role of our specialists and intervention teachers. So, Trisha. Absolutely. So as we talk about support for regular education students um, and support for teachers too, we do currently have positions that I know we've discussed before in our elementary building. So we have a literacy specialist, formerly known as a reading specialist, who supports all aspects of literacy. And currently in our elementary buildings, each elementary building has an intervention teacher and they assume a multitude of roles. They serve primarily as a math specialist, um, but they also provide intervention to students and they facilitate our child study team process. Um, those individuals are essential to our elementary school buildings, as I shared, and you can see the list of their responsibilities there. Um, they're responsible for planning, teaching, and um, working with students who need additional targeted intervention in literacy and math as a part of our um, RTII or tiered academic support. Um, they are at all times working collaboratively with classroom teaching teachers, helping them to plan for instruction for students, students who are struggling, students who are on grade level, students who are in need of enrichment. Um, and they also support teacher learning. So they can at any time be meeting with a group of teachers to help them plan for instruction, look at their data, both in literacy and or math. And um, both positions also support in the facilitation and implementation of a pre-referral process. So as we think about students who are struggling, they sit on the team of students and are a part of that team that comes together to brainstorm strategies to support both academically and behaviorally in that first tier of intervention before we would move to a child study team or a referral evaluation process. Um, so those positions are critical. As we look towards the 5-6 and the 7-8 building, um, we are proposing, uh, and I know Dr. Crefredo has spoken to it before, and I'll kind of have him move to the next slide, but we are proposing that we would maintain um, literacy specialist position in the 5-6 building, and then a literacy specialist in the 7-8 building, and then an intervention teacher we're calling them math specialists at the five, six, and seven, eight to really support and hone in on that math area, which is their primary primary responsibility, even at the elementary building. So you'll see there the student enrollments and what we currently have at each of our four elementary buildings, and then what we're proposing in the five, six building. You'll see an asterisk noted next to the five, six. That's because one of those positions um, is intended to be filled by a specialist at, um, that's currently in one of our elementary buildings. Now that position would need to then be filled. That one is not absorbed, but the seven, eight position we are is currently slated to be filled by a middle school position that would not need to be filled. So we just noted asterisks there next to those positions, but that's what we're proposing with the, um, idea in mind that we would use those individuals to support during that core extension block so that they would also be pushing into classrooms both in our five six in houses or potentially pulling students pulling students from the same house um, into that learning commons to provide support or intervention or enrichment and then in seven eight they would be pushing into either ela or math classrooms so I'm confused on your asterisks. Is this is this saying we're going to need more teachers, or we're just redistributing? So the seven eight is a redistribution. Um, the five six actually, Dr. Fredo and I spoke this afternoon, but then Dr. Hammond reminded me that is a position that we shifted, but would need to be filled. So that those are two positions as literacy. I shifted, but needed to be filled. The, the litter, the five, six building positions, those two are new positions. We transitioned someone from one of our elementary buildings, but oh, that so left an opening in one of our elementary buildings. So we would have to backfill. So those are new positions that I think we're in, have been in conversations, but not officially discussed. So it would be a net of two literacy and one math. Mm -hmm. Did I read that right? Mm -hmm. At the five, six, yes. No overall. And and then in a, there is not currently a math specialist in the 7-8 building. So, and we've seen lists before of staff needed for the 5-6 center. Is this an addition to the, this is- They have, list? yeah. The, in that list somewhere. Yeah, the original list where we had, we kind of had them up. Um, last year as we went through. This year, as we started breaking it down, we started figuring out 
over the summer, we were able to look at where our staff were. So I did bring them off the list that I shared with you last month, knowing that we needed to come back to you and highlight that. So uh, they were on the original. I took them off more recently because I realized it was now gonna warrant new staff and I didn't wanna project those to you in the beginning of the year. We knew we needed to have a separate conversation to highlight these roles and talk about the model. I think we got to look at challenging ourselves a little bit. If we're pulling out all this fifth graders and sixth graders out of the different buildings, you know, how can we also pull out an equal amount of staff without adding a bunch of new staff? Because it still should be the same amount of students being serviced. And I get it. If you need, if you don't have a math specialist in the middle school now, you think you need one, that's a different story. But, um, but I think we need to challenge ourselves on how do we, shuffle the deck some and, and be creative because you can't just keep adding and adding and adding and uh, running into problems eventually. Great. No, and we will. We're continuing to work the numbers. We're looking at the staffing. The only challenge to that is we continue to grow. Um, you know, we added two fifth grade classes sure. now. So, uh, but I, I hear you and I think we've always tried to look at those creative where well, we can go. So we'll but certainly come back on, on these staffing items. But the... Um, as we grow, right, I get your need for specialists, but on the flip side, you need a teacher to service 30 kids, right? That's a that's a, a must-have. This falls more into not necessarily the must-haves as much because when you have, you know, like I said, I 30 more kids, you need a teacher automatically, right? Yep. So that's why I'm saying we've got to figure out how to make do with some of these because as we grow, we got to add teachers to fill classrooms. Sure. These positions, we got to figure out how to make do. I, I will say I agree that we need classroom teachers to to fill that, but I don't think that uh, literacy specialists and math interventions is, are actually nice to haves. I think they're actually essential to haves, especially when you're talking about a district that is changing in terms of needs and diversity and students at different levels across the different grades. So as we continue to diversify in every sense of that word, these support specialists are actually gonna play a pretty big role. So I agree with you. I'd like to see a little bit more on what this looks like and, and how um, the staffing looks in the elementary schools, but these are actually, I think of them as part of an integral part to the classroom teachers, the special education teachers, our uh, special area teachers, they're actually a pretty integral part to the elementary in particular. And I could see the five, six, seven, eight education, so. Well, certainly hearing both feedback. I mean, we do think the positions are important, but I understand Mr. Barrett's concern is we've added staff. Um, I know we sat here and asked for a lot of staff last year as well. So we are gonna come back I think Trisha and I will be back in a, a few months. I mean, I, I already let you know that the five, six, seven, eight staffing, you'll get three updates. We kind of gave you first blush last month. We'll, we'll look at December, January, and then another one, uh, probably early spring, so that you have a sense well before budget season about any staffing implications. So we'll we'll be bringing this back, but we wanted to at least make sure you knew what the positions were, how they were utilized, and what the benefits were, so that we can, you know, make 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 these type of decisions. All right. Um, Trisha, should let's see. Am I on the right slide? Oh, yeah, that, that was it. it. That was it. Thank you. You are on the right slide. All right, that's uh, the, the end. All right, Trisha, thank you very much. I appreciate that. So next, I know we're going to have Ms. Blake is here. She's going to provide a, a quick update on our reimagined website. Even though I believe we launched first week in August, um, this was a presentation and and that Jen wanted to deliver then. So we're able to provide it to you now. She'll give you some feedback uh, since we've been live for the better part of a month or so. Um, we'll get her set. And Jen, you can begin whenever you're ready. All right, thanks for the introduction. We are um, two months and a few days out from the launch of our new website. So I just wanted to circle back and sort of um, summarize where we've been and where we're going from here. So um, as I've shared with you, our new site was intended to be desktop and mobile responsive. It is. I hope you've all had the chance to look at it on both platforms. Um, it does take a little bit of getting used to when you switch to the mobile, but all of the functionality is there that you see on the desktop site. Um, 
So we're launched and the question is, did we meet our goals? So we wanted to ensure that the new site supports and enhances the district brand um, by focusing on clear, concise content. We cut the content of our site significantly, almost 75%. A majority of that was found in the elimination of the teacher pages and the internal resources that were on our site. Um, we also worked with every department in every school to make sure that the information is updated and current and accurate. Um, and we're now using more high quality student photos and videos on the site. You'll see more and more of that as uh, webmasters continue to be trained and the staff in my office is contributing to that. Um, as I've said, we've moved all internal content away from the public facing system. We're now using teams internally to communicate staff resources and information that were once found on our site. We're maximizing the site user friendly. So search function, for example, uh, less PDFs, um, an enhanced translation function, all of those things make the site um, easier to navigate for all of the families that visit uh, or all the community members. We have people from around the world who take our site. Um, and then uh, we are working to finalize the implementation of a mobile app that will allow users to further customize the content from an app on their phone. It will be the great value school district app. If you want to customize, it'll be like a theme feature, kind of like a social media, where you can customize the calendars you want to see, the menus you want to see, and the content you want to see. Um, the content links will go back to our site and then they'll be responsive. So it'll that, it allows the user to further customize, making it even more user friendly for them. Um, we launched um, two initial videos when we launched the site around how to use the new website, both on a mo mobile device and on a desktop device. Um, more recently, we released a video about how to sync the calendar. You can download the events that are on the district or any school calendar into your personal calendar, either on your mobile device or on your desktop computer. So we just released a video that explains that. The next video will be about the translation function of our site. That will be a video that we've done in both English and Spanish, so that families who don't speak English know how to change the language of the site and to navigate around it. Once you change the language in a browser and close the browser, you can reopen it and stay in that language, which I think is nice for our families who are not um, English speakers. Uh, and then we have some other videos planned around navigating the school menus, um, accessing school board information um, and things like that. So those will continue to come out over the next couple of months. They are posted on our website and they're also available on social media. Um, they're getting a lot of engagement, so that's good to see. And we've been gathering feedback about the new site. When we launched the site, we sent an email out and included the link to the survey. That link also is on the homepage of the district site. We've only gotten 37 responses to date which says to me that people are either not that unhappy yet or they're finding what they need. Most of those responses have been from staff who are struggling to figure out where the staff resources are. <laughs> so we continue to communicate with our staff, we faculty meetings. Um, Tracy Whiteman in our technology department has built a really robust back end where staff resources are. So we've been working with staff so that they understand where they can go for those resources. None of them were eliminated, they were just moved to a different platform. In September, um, we talked about the new site with our PKC members. Um, the feedback was really good. Um, the search feed for search function is something that people seem to be appreciating, as well as the uh, quick view of the school menus. Mm -hmm. um, I also met in September with two different PTOs to get feedback. Again, it was primarily positive. There were some suggestions. One of the suggestions, for example, was you know, in addition to the online calendar menus, the menus calendar, can you still post a PDF that's user friendly, you know, like kind of cute with the kind of on a refrigerator? So we've made those adjustments. That's the kind of feedback I'm getting and where we can accommodate if we are. Um, and we've also got email feedback from some people with suggestions or things that they like, things that they're frustrated with, and you can help me clarify. So we've been answering those. But overall, it's been pretty quiet feedback wise, even though we've been soliciting it. Um, and I hope that means that people are taking their time to learn the new site and are happy with the way it looks. Um, so what's next? We are we have um, two EDR positions. They are webmasters at the middle school and high school. And then at the elementary buildings, someone in the office is assigned to help with website. Those people update the news items and the calendar features on all the pages. 
So we continue to train those web dancers, helping them be comfortable in the new platform, um, helping them to learn some of the functionality around adding photos, getting away from PDFs, things like that. This is the back end is completely different than it was before. So we're slow and steady with the training and providing support as much as we can. We've also implemented a ticketing system that people can use. It's similar to the ticketing system we use for technology support, where if people need information added to the site, if there's a you know, correction that needs to be made, they have suggestions, they're using that ticketing system. Our uh, promise has been that we can respond in 53 eight hours, and we have been so far able to do that. We're not getting an overwhelming number of requests for changes or edits. Um, we're continuing to gather feedback. The survey link will stay on the site through probably the end of December. Um, I still have additional PTOs. I've offered to company with them, so I'm, I'm going to see if they reach out. And we'll continue to use PKC to touch base on what's working well and what parents are liking or not liking. Um, as I said, we are considering all of the feedback and making the adjustments as they seem appropriate. From the very beginning of this project, we have committed to not adding something because one person asks for it, right? So we're trying to stay true to that. But if someone makes a suggestion that just seems to sort of innately make sense, um, and or a few people start asking the same question, we are considering those additions and making them as we can. As I said, we're developing the mobile app. We hope to have that launched by the beginning of next month. And then um, in addition to the ongoing updates, things like the volunteer policy change, um, we will plan to start building the five, six center subsite in the later part of the year with the goal of launching that in the uh, beginning of the summer. Questions, feedback? Um, I have two questions. Uh, one, I know you said you only have 37 responses back from the surveys, but have you gotten any feedback in any other way about how the um, translation of the pages are going? Did we pick the right languages or do we not know? No, not yet, but we, we picked five languages that are most spoken by um, families in our district. And there's actually a dashboard that goes along with that translate function where I can go in and see how many times the site has been translated into each of those languages. So we'll continue to monitor that. Um, so far, Spanish has been the number one translation, and I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but I will go in every couple of months and monitor that. And if we see that something is really not getting any use at all, we may revisit um, or even survey to see if we need to make an adjustment. Our current agreement includes those five languages. If we were to bump it to more languages, it would come up an additional one. Okay. Great. And then I think I took this online survey. Um, I think I was one of the responses, but one of the things I noticed was that if you, um, if you take, if you want to provide feedback, you have to go through all the survey questions first. And then there's like that free response where you can type in information. Um, I was on there again. And then I noticed that one of the email addresses was wrong and I clicked the feedback button. I was like, I don't want to take this survey again. I'm just going to email you directly. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious if um, we're not getting a lot of online survey responses. I'm just curious if maybe there's plans to reduce the survey to like one question and an open response, you know, how do you like it on a scale of one to five? And then what do you want to tell me? Because sometimes when you're moving quick, you just want to say, Hey, I'm going through this. And I noticed this email address is wrong or this wasn't where I thought it was, but then when you're hit with five, six questions, it you just it's a deterrent. So just seeing the number 37, thinking of other ways to get people to get feedback to you because this was such a labor of love, you just want some information on it. That's a great suggestion. And yeah. maybe maybe when January comes, we're finished with the first survey, that quick, like we can even do a pop-up that says, tell us how you feel about the site. That's great. The other thing that we can do is we do have an email account associated with, you know, if you have a question or comment about the website, but maybe you can publicize it or make it more obvious on the site. Oh yeah, I didn't know, so I emailed you. So, okay, cool, okay. well, thank you. It looks great. I love it. And I love the um, the menus. It is pasted inside my cabinet as well. So thank you for bringing those back. <laughs> it's important. You got to know what day chicken sure. day is. Jen, thank you for all your thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All right, Chuck. You have no presentations either, right? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> All right, let's hear them. <laughs> All right. Uh, under facilities, the facilities committee did meet, um, uh, I think, two weeks ago, 
and we went over all of the uh, current projects that are going on, provided updates on all those, and then we started looking at what future projects are we going to tackle. So we had a, a productive meeting, and we'll have further input from that committee on future agendas. Uh, item 6.02 is change order, order number 14 with Lobar, the, the general contractor at the Phi 6 Center. Uh, this particular change order is in the amount of $16,720. This was a subcontractor of low bars that in, uh, incorrectly cut through the, the floor in the original uh, district office. And um, they, they, they cut too deep and caused damage. Uh, so then we had to do a, a change order to fix that. We had to get architectural involvement to make sure that the um, the the uh, future uh, that the floor would hold in the future. This is a insurance uh, reimbursable. So the entire amount will be reimbursed to the district from the owner controlled insurance program. Item 6.03 is change order 15 with low bar in the amount of $46,862. This was a combination of three or four different projects that they put in one change order. It had to do with fireproofing, uh, changing the walls, some of the walls from six inches to eight inches to accommodate the wiring and plumbing and the infrastructure in those walls. And it also involved adding some additional walls that weren't on the design. Uh, when we reviewed this with uh, the officers, there was a question about um, at what point do, does the architect or engineers take responsibilities for these things? And I reported that we are in talks with both uh, the architect and the engineer and have a plan when we get closer to the end of the project, we have site logic tracking all of the change orders and which ones were errors and omissions. And we are gonna have those discussions and believe that both the architect and the engineering firm uh, will be in a position to reimburse some money to the school district. Uh, these kinds of things do happen in, in big projects like this, but maybe in this case, some of them uh, could have been uh, avoided. Item, uh, Change order number 16 is the church road, or, uh, church road stormwater drainage ongoing issue. This was, again, low bar. Uh, this was a requirement to put in additional stormwater drainage, and the uh, cost was $23,668.90. Uh, this is, you know, mostly a result of all the uh, intense downpours of rain we've had over the last months and months and uh, what's been happening with the water runoff there. And um, the the engineers and architects and the um, conservation district all decided we needed to take additional measures. Item 605 is change order number one with Iron Eagle. Um, Iron Eagle is a subcontractor to low bar on the Phi 6 Center, but they're a, a direct contractor to the school district for the um, seven acre project and the road work on, on Church and Swedesford. So this is change order number one with them in the amount of $8,586. This was to relocate the uh, uh, caution sign that blinks on, on Swedesford Road to get the traffic to slow down. Uh, the way the drainage had to be done, the, the uh, whole sign had to be moved back, a bigger standard put in. Uh, so you'll see that has been relocated closer to Mill Lane. Item six, uh, 606 is change order number four with the, the district office. Uh, this is with the um, electrical uh, company, uh, Phillips. Uh, the amount is $7,861.12. When they were installing the pad for the generator, they ran into a lot of rock. We've, we've had this happen on the, the five, six center site too. So they had to excavate a lot of rock uh, to be able to pour the foundation for the, the generator. Item 607 is a contract with the Gordian Group. Uh, the Gordian Group is uh, a function of the, or a, 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 a company that works with the Keystone Purchasing Network. They do uh, pre-bid construction work. So they, they bid unit prices for plumbing and electrical and general contracting. Uh, this this is the, the ability, gives us the ability not to hire an architect to do design and, and drawings and not to, we don't have to go out for bid. This is a bid approved, pre-bid approved. Uh, this kind of job is too small um, for going out and doing bidding and it's a little too big for, for our, our employees. 
Um, so this, this contract works out really well. This is to uh, install two additional office in this offices in the student services area of the high school, and they'll be used by the new mental health therapist and the student assistance program liaison. So as we grow in these schools, we, we continue to run out of space and have to make accommodations. Chuck, just a question. Yes. Was that in the facilities? Was that on the long list of facilities projects? I know it's not a huge amount. I'm just wondering if it... I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I, I was wondering if this is you know a brand new project or if this is something that has been on that list and and now it's time to do it i i just i mean it's small i was just curious if it's a yeah a when the board either. approved these additional positions the high school staff started working on where they're going to place everybody then they started working with dr gafredo and and ken morris and myself how can we accommodate these things and we uh, ultimately decided that we could put up some more walls and electric and stuff in the student services area to accommodate these so things. it's more and it's not a years old Correct. facilities project. It Correct. needed to be yes. done because of the staff. I get it. Thank you. Yes. Sense. Item 608 is a uh, contract with Keystone Sports, a three year contract. This is a renewal, $2,979 a year uh, for each of the three years. There's no escalation, escalation in there. They do the GMAT testing, which is the compact testing of the field to make sure that when the um, athletes fall down on the field that there's enough give in the, in the turf. They also do uh, maintenance to the turf. They fix problems with it. And um, they've been doing a good job for us uh, with that new field. Item 609 is a hold. Um, and we hope that we'll have the uh, official item on for the business set, uh, meeting a week from now. Uh, this is for mechanical commissioning for all of the systems at the 5-6 Center. So you always, we always um, standard business operating procedure is to hire a third-party testing company that comes in and makes sure all the systems are working the way they should, that the right air exchanges are happening and all that. Um, we did a request for proposals. They were due by, um, by today. And we have a meeting on Friday to go over all those proposals and vet them and uh, make a recommendation to the board. This is a large ticket item. I expect it to come in somewhere between 70, 65 and $105,000. I think uh, if the one bid turns out, I think we'll be closer to that like $70,000 mark. And that's it on uh, facilities. Do you want me to move to, tran or to uh, transportation or are there other questions? No? Keep rolling. All right. Uh, 701 is approval of new craft drivers. There, I think there are five on that list and one must bus monitor. So we're we're happy to sign on new drivers. And 702 is an addendum to the craft contract, our our uh, contract for our transportation contractor. Um, the contract is expires in 26. So this is an addendum to that to increase the cost of the daily rates of the various bus runs. And it's a um, the money's going to be passed on dollar for dollar to the drivers in order to get the wage rate up from $21 an hour to $24 an hour. Um, we hope that this will continue to attract new drivers, even though there are five on the agenda tonight. We're st still uh, have a, a, a large shortage of drivers, and that's why we have to do a lot of double runs at most of our uh, element or at all of our elementary schools. That's it on transportation. Food service, we don't have anything. Technology, we don't have anything. So that takes us to finance. Item 10.01 is our annual approval for be part of the conversation for the 23-24 speaker series. This will be paid by Title IV funds and it's $8,000 for three programs. Item 10.02 is our annual per pupil budget. Uh, each year when we start the budget process, we do an allocation to all the schools and the uh, administrators of those buildings and their staff build their budgets based on their allotment. This is for general supplies and books and those kinds of things. Um, we take the uh, enrollment from uh, the beginning of the school year and we project it out for next year. And then we at, uh, assign a cost per student to that budget and assign, you know, based on the student count is, is generates their, the budget that we give them. This budget has not been inflated. These are the same uh, per cost per student numbers that we gave them last year. Uh, we hadn't done a, couple, a raise in a few years. Last year, we did put a 3% escalator on. And in monitoring the budget so far, 
Um, it looks like this, we've allocated enough money to the schools to meet their needs. Uh, however, if their unexpected needs come up, we always have a reserve that we can we can help them out. As we go through the budget process and they build their budgets, if we find having a no increase uh, doesn't work, then we'll come back to the board with another recommendation. For, for now, this is the same allocation per student as it was this current school year, only adjusted by the number of students in each each school. 1003 is a educational service contract with Camp Hill. 1004 is an agreement with Chester County IU for them to provide educational services for the uh, students that are assigned to Devereaux. Um, since if, since that the, the facilities in our home district, we would be responsible to do that education, but we assign that to the Chester County Intermediate Unit. 1005 is uh, education, another educational service contract with LearnWell. 1006 is a request to start four new student activities, a cricket club, Operation Smile Club, Kits for Kids Club, and a Black Student Union. Chuck, Finally, I just want to say, I, I want to recognize, I think that it's, it's great that those new clubs are being formed for, for different um, kids of different backgrounds, different cultural interests. It's great. I do have a question on the Operation Smile. I know what Operation Smile is. I think most of us are familiar with it. I've been involved with them in the past. And I assume that this Operation Smile Club is associated with Operation Smile. It says they're giving the money, and maybe it's just what they were in. It says they're giving the money to, to, to someone who needs a surgery, but I assume they're giving the money to Operation Smile. We're not giving the money to a, the club isn't raising money and sending it to some patient somewhere, right? I, I just wanna make sure it's associated with Operation Smile. That's what it sounds, that's what I assume it by the name, but. The way it's written, it sounds like the kids are going to have a bake sale and send money to someone for a surgery, which I don't think. Is we right. can get that clarification okay, just, for next week. Because it's an official organization, and I want to make sure we're not just using the name and then doing something different. If, if we're using if we're using a real uh, an official organization's name, we should be you know going through them and making sure that we're not you know doing anything untoward. I'm sure we're not. It might just be not clear. That's all. That's all. <laughs> It almost implies they are because it says the funds will be given to those who need surgery. However, if we earn more money than one surgery costs, right, we yeah. would get, use it for gifts or raffles. Yeah, it's just that's what's why would you just give 1.2? Right. If, if you're giving the money to Operation yeah. Smile, if you're giving money for a tenth of a surgery or right. for that's 2. my point. Four, yeah. It's just, so, yeah. yeah, if we could, yeah. Uh, maybe. are they officially maybe. are they allied with? It? Operation Smile, or are they using their name? And if they're using their name, they shouldn't. They should call it something else and be more explicit about what they're doing. Yeah. Right. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but I love all the ideas of all these clubs. It's wonderful that the students are so proactive and wanting to help people. 1007 is a proposal to get a salary and wage study done by a resource development company. Um, the district has done wage studies uh, about every decade. Uh, it's probably been more than a decade since we did the last one, and given the escalating uh, salaries that we've experienced and the difficulty we're having hiring people, uh, we think it would be in the best interest of the district to do another study. Um, uh, Sharima Giveny, my assistant, has experience with this company when she worked at the IU. They've done it. They did a good job, um, and the cost is twelve thousand eight hundred and eighty dollars. And finally, uh, we have a whole, another hold here, the Reisman Educational Consulting. This would be a contract for professional development for the social studies department using Title II funds. And our teaching and learning department is negotiating the cost of that contract. If they're successful and happy with the amount, we'll have this on for the agenda Monday. And if not, we'll, we'll pull it off. So that covers all of the financial items. Any, any questions? Just have a general question about Title IV funds. How much do we receive in Title IV funds annually? And is it a like a use it or a lose it? Or um, can we carry them over? What are the contingencies for that? Yeah, I'll get that amount for you for, for next week. And all of these grant funds are use it or lose it. But it just depends on how much time they give you. And usually there's a grace period after the fiscal year ends. But and our our departments do a great job. Our business office working with teaching and learning, they monitor those things and they they almost always make sure the money is spent on a timely basis. But let me get the total for you uh, for next Monday night. Thank, Thank you. you.
Um, Chuck, I have a question related to um, facilities. I know last year we tried to bid out the playgrounds and we didn't get any bids. Are we looking to put those up for bid earlier in the year um, rather than later when it's kind of do or don't do time? Yes, um, we are definitely going to bid out the general lane again. And we talked about since we're a year behind of doing two. And the recommendation is at this point to do Charlestown. Um, and we're talking to our engineering company right now about uh, getting a proposal that they could do specs develop specification developments. We also know that um, Willistown has some grant money left over and we're putting an official request from them to see if they'll help with the uh, with the playground cost. Uh, we don't know if that'll happen or not. We do know that right now they have just over $50,000 remaining and we're asking them for the 50,000 to help with that playground. But Charlestown is the one we've identified to do uh, next. And um, if if we're fortunate, we'll get that done and get the, the bid out probably in December to get in line for the summer of 24. Thank you. Um, for Charlestown, don't they have two playgrounds? Is it yes. able to keep two? playgrounds or yeah just like one? just like general wayne we'll do that as part of the study to, to see if it makes sense to combine them or not you know financially and programmatically and we'll report it's a lot smaller school it's not the kindergarten wing right um it might make more sense where general wayne it was the mm -hmm. kindergarten section so in different yeah. topography too uh general yeah, yeah. Wayne has a lot of slopes so right it could be feasible there for sure yeah and it may make it more attractive for the general contractor to because I think the issue before was the general contractor wasn't making a lot of money pushing dirt around. It was really the people that put in the playground. Yeah. That they subbed out to that were making the money. So, yes. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, any committee reports or board comments? One question I had for next week or whenever the next five, six center update is, and especially as you're talking about the calendar. Are there, what are the remaining big um, milestones for the building that will help, that will know more or less that we're still on track? We say we're on track right now, I have no doubt, obviously you're, it, it's true. However, what are the big things? And we know if we don't hit in February X, Y, and Z, then we're, we're delayed six months or whatever. Do those milestones exist? And will that help guide us to know when we're gonna have to call it? Sure. We we um, give an update at every business meeting, so we'll have that ready for you for, for Monday. And we really do, like all the systems, we haven't shared it. So on a few of the presentations we have, there's this master schedule that has the benchmarks on. Maybe we'll just take a little more time to highlight those keystone elements there for you. So those, those hallmarks, I understand the essence of your question. So uh, Chuck, maybe we can even dig up one of those larger plans and just even put it in board docs for your review. Because I know the calendar is such a sensitive thing for families. Um, so I hate messing with it if we don't have to, <laughs> unless everybody really is fine starting after Labor Day. But I know that puts us over into the year. So I'm one of the it too, I'll confess. Yeah. yeah. So if we know like more context around what's going to force that decision, I'd love to know it. At the construction meetings, the site logic has been adamant um, for a long time now on having that discussion on equipment with long lead times all along, because that's been a big problem with all construction projects is HVAC equipment and, and switch gear equipment. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and we have uh, boilers. Um, we have almost everything on site already uh, in terms of that. Uh, I think there might be one more thing that's coming in, in December, but um, that that's one thing we're worried about. And I think almost everything is is in place already. So that, that's good news. But yeah, there are other milestones that we'll, we can touch what, base there. When you mentioned equipment, that makes me think even of furniture. I know we're talking about furniture for the district office, which is in a few weeks, mm -hmm. but you obviously need all the furniture in the school. We know there have been delays in supply chains of that for years. So, yeah. and the furniture, big equipment and little equipment. Right? So, and yeah. furniture, we know that order has to really be placed yeah. December, no later than January. Am I right on that, Chuck? Yeah, that's our goal is to get the purchase orders out uh, by January, and um, the, the staff's working diligently on that now, and and we're working with with company that we are going to go out for bid. We're not going to use state contract pricing. We're going to go out for bid. Because uh, it's a it's a big price tag.
All right. Yep. Uh, draft agenda is there for approval for next week. Uh, being no public for any public comment, we'll skip that. <laughs> Board met in an executive uh, session to discuss some legal issues. At this point, I'll adjourn the meeting. Uh, have a good week. See you next week. Thank you.